My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you are thinking. Think. I think we're in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing. Again. Nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember. Those are pearls that were his eyes. The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot is a series of fragments like the one we just saw. In the span of 434 lines, Eliot makes over 60 different allusions to over 40 different writers from all walks of life. Some from the East, some from the West, some modern and some ancient. It is bits and pieces of a culture which Eliot thought had once given each of us a universal point of reference. The voices spilling and piling on top of each other in the wasteland are the echoes, the last remnants of this shared culture that was now shattered. In the midst of the Roaring Twenties, T.S. Eliot rose to prominence as part of the Lost Generation, a term coined to describe the disoriented, wandering, and directionless feeling of those who had lived through the most destructive war the world had ever seen. Eliot, like so many others, was trying to make sense of the chaos and violence of his time. Initially, he looks for this order, not in religion, but within literature and mythology. Eliot says not only the title, but a good deal of the symbolism of the poem were suggested by Miss Jessie L. Weston's book on the legend of the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is the cup from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper and was used to collect his blood after the crucifixion. In Grail legends, the Fisher King, the guardian of the Holy Grail, lies dying in his castle, wounded, in need of a knight to complete the quest for the Grail so he can heal. The recovery of the king is the only thing that can rescue the kingdom. The knight must face numerous obstacles, and near the end of his journey, passes through the perilous chapel, a nightmarish place that represents his biggest challenge. When he finds the grail, it restores the king and his kingdom, and it restores vitality and life to the barren wasteland. This idea of a sick land in desperate need of rebirth is the essence of Europe after World War I. The people of Eliot's time were suffering, with no sign of relief. But despite the poem's desperation, Eliot still leaves us with a sense of how hope can be restored. Eliot refers to figures surrounding the Holy Chalice, the impotent king, the wasteland, the rejoicing of the restored kingdom, but rarely to the cup itself. In Eliot's solution, the grail is of vital importance, but it does not magically appear in the final stanzas to rescue us. Instead, he felt it is up to mankind to construct our own salvation. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. The first lines are written in almost perfect iambic meter. Think of meter as a poem's underlying structure, the rhythm beneath the words in each line. An I am is made up of an unstressed and stressed syllable, and its use in a poem typically gives the reader a sense of stability. But Eliot's use of enjambment, the way he carries each phrase over the line breaks, keeps making them unstable. Every thought seems unfinished. By the final three lines, the I have begun to break down, and each unfinished thought increasingly undermines our sense of certainty. Most of us think of April and spring as a time of joy. Winter has left and flowers bloom. Life begins to emerge as the bitter cold passes away, but what used to give us meaning no longer speaks to us. A time of year which used to bring new life now only stirs dull roots. In the next line, we get another inversion of values. If this desire to reclaim the innocence of a pre-war Europe is never going to be realized, 
then the only thing that could truly comfort us is forgetting. Snow acts as that numbing agent, allowing us to forget. Springtime is cruel because it strips away those numbing agents and leaves us with the harsh reality that perhaps no life will ever grow from that dead soil. Perhaps there is no hope for salvation, resurrection, or rebirth. Unreal city. Under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. The crowd flowing under London Bridge is a stream of commuters heading to the financial district where Elliot worked as an investment banker. The line, I had not thought death had undone so many, is taken directly from Dante's Inferno. Dante says this about a crowd of people waiting outside the gates of hell. Elliot is saying it about commuters heading to work. In Elliot's view, these people go about their lives suspended between living and dying, and their mass inertia is seen as a continuous escape and evasion of reality. This allusion to Dante allows Elliot to suggest one of the main ideas of the wasteland. Old stories lie beneath modern streets. In his lecture on the wasteland, Nick Mount says that London is Rome, London is Athens, London is Dante's hell. The difference is, those old stories and places were meaningful, real, and authentic. But the new versions of these old stories have become hollow and drained of that meaning. All these allusions are not meant to help the reader. In fact, they make the poem much harder to understand. Eliot does this very purposefully, because he knows that if you can understand him, if you get the references, then you feel what he feels, and you can't help but mourn the death of this shared culture along with him. Part 2 of The Wasteland is called A Game of Chess, but chess is mentioned only once in the entire section. Instead, Ellie discusses marriage, and this becomes the arena in which the game is played. Chess is a cerebral game involving strategy and scheming. Matters of the heart and soul have become so degraded that they have been reduced to each person trying to outwit and outmaneuver the other. The chair she sat in like a burnished throne glowed on the marble. In vials of ivory and colored glass, unstoppered, lurked her strange synthetic perfumes, unguent, powdered or liquid, troubled, confused and drowned the scents in odors. Elliot paints us a picture of a Cleopatra-type woman surrounded by all the wealth and sophistication we could imagine. This is the image of the queen, cold and independent, who outwits and outmatches everyone she meets. The queen is the most powerful piece in a game of chess. She is winning the game because she has drowned the senses and successfully subdued her opponent, her husband, the king. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, Hurry up, please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back, make yourself a bit smart. You'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Hurry up, please. It's time. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. And her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta-da. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. The scene has shifted again, and now we are overhearing gossip in a pub. A woman is describing a conversation she had with her friend Lil. Lil's husband is coming back from the war, and her speaker is telling her to look nice for him. Maybe get some new teeth. 
The couple we saw earlier could not communicate. But here we have an aggressive and belittling marriage. Sex is being used as a threat. It is simply another move on the chessboard. If you don't make yourself attractive, Albert has the right to seek it elsewhere. Over this conversation, we hear the words, Hurry up, please, it's time. This is the traditional last call of the English bartender, telling them it is closing time. It is time to go. But it also suggests something else. Two women gossiping in a bar with a voice telling them it's time. There is something they must do. It can be thought of as that ancient poetic call of carpe diem, seize the day. Yet this urge to seize the present moment is drowned out by the gossip of the pub. It is a call that seems to fall deaf on modern ears. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Finally, everyone gives their goodbyes, and we are left with a final voice saying, Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. These are the final words spoken by Ophelia in Shakespeare's Hamlet just before she dies. Ophelia's parting words, one of the most beautiful scenes in Western literature, are now words overheard in a bar in a conversation about false teeth. More fragments, yet another old story beneath modern life. Everything that once had meaning is now lost. As for Lil, she seems to be left with two options. She can either become the queen on the chessboard outwitting and outmaneuvering her husband in order to dominate him. Or she can collapse like Ophelia and simply bow out and fade away. Elliot describes section five as the approach to the perilous chapel where the grail is held. In the original grail legend, the sight of the empty chapel is the final test the knight must pass before drinking from the grail. The knight confronts the greatest test of all, the possibility that there is no God. It is only after finding the empty chapel and continuing forward that the knight can know true immortality in Christ. Here is no water but only rock, rock and no water and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were the sound of water only, where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 but there is no water. Our speaker is desperately seeking water in the wasteland. The water from the grail offers eternal life, holding the promise for resurrection, redemption, and rebirth. But there is no water, no hope, no salvation. And then... In a flash of light, then a damp gust, bringing rain. At the chapel, it finally rains. Water is returned to the wasteland. When it rains, thunder comes, and the thunder speaks. It says one word. <laughs> this section is inspired by a story from the Upanishads, which talks about how the gods, men, and demons of India asked their father how they should live. The father answered each of them with the sound of thunder, which was heard as da. But each group interprets this in different ways. The gods hear it as data, to give. Men hear it as diadvam, to sympathize, and the demons hear it as damyata, control. Da is the answer. It is the holy grail. It is the meaning missing from the poem and from the world. It holds the promise of restoring life to the wasteland, but no one quite knows what it means. Da. What have we given? The awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. Earlier in the poem, a speaker sits by the River Thames and weeps, for the nymphs have departed. The nymphs were the young lovers who used to gather around the river, 
but now they are gone and have been replaced by those who leave no addresses. Those who meet only to fulfill a momentary desire, never to speak to each other again. By this, and this only, we have existed. This lack of intimacy has become our final legacy. Brief, meaningless encounters are all we have left to give. Da! Diadvam. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison, thinking of the key. Each confirms a prison. Deyadvam means to sympathize. But we cannot sympathize with each other while trapped in our own prison. If you remember, earlier in the poem, each man fixed his eyes before his feet. We are isolated and fixated on our own self-preservation and are unable to recognize who holds the key because we cannot look beyond our selfish concerns. Da! Damiata! The boat responded gaily to the hand, expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. Damiata means control, but Elliot speaks not of seizing, but relinquishing of control. Man cannot leave the wasteland on our own. We are trapped and must give sail and oar over to controlling hands, to something greater than ourselves. Data, to give. As selfish and corrupt lovers, we must learn to give something meaningful, lasting, and eternal. Diadvam, to sympathize. We are isolated and alone, each confined to our own prison, thinking of the key and not of each other. It is only in understanding our fellow man that we can be freed from our isolation. Damyata, control. We cannot leave the wasteland on our own, but perhaps the giving up of control can help us navigate the seas back home. For those lost in the wasteland, being torn apart by their desires, perhaps it is an ascetic self-surrender and rediscovery of the spiritual journey that holds the key to our salvation. I sat upon the shore fishing with the arid plain behind me. Shall I at least set my lands in order? The scene now shifts back to the Fisher King. The king gives up hope that someone will complete the quest for the grail, but he decides to put the sad pieces of his kingdom back together in the best way he can. This is Elliot's rejection of the idea that a savior must be mystical and all-powerful. He looks pragmatically at the world and tells Europe how it must heal itself by letting time mend all wounds. The The last few stanzas break down into a babble of four different languages. And through this, we reach the end of the poem. Tata, Dayadvam. Damyata Shanti 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 is Sanskrit for the peace which passes understanding. With this parting line, Eliot is saying he's gone as far as words will allow him to go. There is nothing left to be said. It is possible that the person speaking these words has reached peace or nirvana. But if so, it is not accessible or comprehensible to anyone but that one individual. It is something that can be experienced, but it cannot be understood or explained. Five years later, Eliot found the meaning, the order, and the peace he was looking for in the church. He was baptized behind closed doors, in secret, in 1927. If it is peace this poem strives to attain, then, as Eliot says, it is a peace which passes understanding. It is private. It is behind a closed door. The final note of the wasteland is not one of fear or anxiety. Eliot is leaving us with the hope that perhaps there is an ultimate peace and harmony to things, even if it lies beyond our comprehension.